This week in fantasy, week seven preview, and we got a guest this time. It's the man with the numbers, my cousin Spencer, who's sitting pretty in his division. He's tied with Cam, but it's Cam going into bye week, so no one else is even close. Spencer, how are you, and how do you feel about your division? I feel pretty good about my spot. I mean, my rankings are really off, though, because right now I'm sitting second, and I know I predict myself first, but... You know, we'll see. We'll see where things end up shaking out. That's about as far off as your rankings get, isn't it, Spencer? Have Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the outlier for this season, Kappa. All right. Speaking of outliers, we can talk about last week when I beat you, putting up a tepid 80-something points as I've been doing all year, and this one was pretty close because. Indy, who looked horrific at the beginning of the year, is sort of getting their shit together, and the Jaguars got me negative while the rest of my team was very average. Uh, What do you think about Indianapolis this year, and are they as bad as they looked at the beginning, and do you think they'll be able to sneak into the wild card? Yeah, their O-line has has been very suspect, and Matt Ryan's looked really frazzled, you know, without the offensive line. But last week we actually saw uh, we actually saw you know some some hints of like what he could be with a good offensive line where he put together a really nice game. I think he set a Colts passing record last week because he got the protection he needed. Yeah, and with the running back that they have, this is a team that is really going to live or die by their offensive line. This isn't the sort of Matt Ryan in. Atlanta, who can solo carry like he used to be able to, I think he's definitely lost a little bit off his fastball and was probably always a little bit overrated. So the Colts are in an incredibly weak division. The Texans are a sewer team. The Jags are super hit or miss. And uh, the Titans don't look the same. So if you were to predict who's going to come out of that division, who do you think is going to win it and with how many wins? Um, who cares? I, I guess, I guess the Titans with like eight wins, but not a playoff threat, right? No matter who wins. Yeah, I mean they're just they're just like that stereotypical team that you just know is going to get trounced, whoever, regardless of who they play. Yep, I totally agree. Philadelphia absolutely dismantled Dallas, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on the Eagles this season and their ability to compete for an NFC title. Do you think that they're the real deal? It depends on what you mean by real deal. If you mean by real deal, they're like good and can win 10 games, like of course. Real deal, like can they make it to the NFC title game and be competitive? I think that's about their their cap for this season. I think that though they look better, I think Hurts is still developing as a passer. Um, I think that you really need to be more multifaceted as a team. Like their trick is sort of working against like mediocre and bad opponents. But like what happens when they play good teams who are like scheming for them? It sort of reminds me of like the Rams in the Super Bowl against the Patriots that year. like. A lot of times teams like hold out like their schemes for like the postseason, you know, and I like, I don't know, like I've, I've seen a lot of their games and it's just, it's hard for me to believe in them. And like when you look at the teams they beat, like none of them are legit. Like I just pull them up. Real like, maybe the Vikings. Who, who maybe, the, maybe the Vikings are the best of the list. It's Lions, Washington. Jaguars, Cardinals, Cowboys, and Cowboys without Dak. I mean, all these teams other than like the Vikings are frauds and like I I'm not that high on the Vikings. I just know some people are. Yeah, well, they're at so least it's not like, Yeah, I mean but and the thing is, the crazy thing when you look at their schedule, like Steelers, Texans, Washington, Colts, Packers. I mean the Packers might be the hardest team they play all year and they're not playing them for another f- five weeks. I mean, I don't see a single team on their schedule that's, like, good. Yeah. Like, the whole whole rest of the season. Um, the best two teams they're playing are going to be, like, I guess the Giants, if you consider them good. I, I think don't. they're frauds. Same. Yeah, I, I don't. 
uh, the Saints or the Packers. Like those are the only three good teams they're playing. So I think they might breeze breeze into like the number one seed in the NFC, just like because they don't play anyone. But I just it's it's hard to me to see them end end up like beating the cream of the crop of the NFC. Like, do you, do we really think they're better than the Bucks in like the postseason? Like the 49ers, like even the Rams who have looked hit or miss, like the Rams still have great defense. And it's just hard for me to like think that they're good. And even though they beat the Vikings, so I guess they're like pretty good. They're five and one. I, I thought they were worse than that, honestly. But I don't know. I just I just don't think I this isn't their year, but they're one of those teams that like you they're set up to be good for a while and you give them you give them a couple like a season or two and like I think all those young guys will develop Hurts will get his act together and they'll be a legitimate Super Bowl threat but I don't think it's this year yeah I I tend to agree I think that they'll make it to the NFC title game I think that their play calling has been better this year I think that Hurts has developed his accuracy he's no longer a guy that looks like he's trying to run after his first read every play and I think the defense is really solid Darius Slay lockdown guy And when I look at some of these other teams in the NFC, like the Cardinals and Rams, I'm sort of thinking like, well, they look vulnerable. And the Eagles are sort of coming up in a time where a lot of teams are either overrated or look way worse than they were supposed to. So I think the Eagles are just going to breeze through the back end of the schedule, though. I I think they'll beat the Giants both times. They play them uh, in one of the last weeks and then in the very last week. So... I think that's like two W's. But we can move on. Is there anything else that you want to touch on regarding this match that we played? No, nah, not not really. I, I mean, it would have been nice looking at the final score if I had had uh, the Raiders kicker, Carlson. But, you know, is what it is. Yep. I know that you were a bit su- uh, surprised with the lineup I went with, benching Najee. Yeah, it was, it was surprising for sure. I don't know. It wasn't like the most surprising thing ever, but when you draft a guy that early, it's like pretty tough to not like stick with him. Yeah, man, the Steelers have just looked so horrific. And really his production came down to the fact that he found the end zone. He hasn't really had a week where he's gotten enough yards to be start worthy just based on yards. He's basically like a flex in that sense where I'm just relying on him to get a touchdown. That was one of those picks picks I made with one eye, one eye closed where I was like, I really don't want this guy, but like, I need a steady running back and he's supposed to get the big workload. I would have been better off picking someone like Debo or like, you know, reaching for a receiver. I, I, I still think like, I mean... He has the volume, and I think Flex is too low. I think he's like a low end to mid tier RB two. Um, I mean, he's he's like good for five every week at a minimum. Um, I probably wouldn't have benched him, honestly. I, I'm not. I would have played him over Singletary for sure. Um, but you know, it is what it is. Okay. So, I don't think that there really was a move you could have made. I guess other than. If you would have started Sutton over Godwin, that would have lost lost you the, the, the week, but that's really the only move that would have. All right, we can move like. on. Uh, yeah. Jackson beat Clap 4, 84 to 94. And this is a pretty resonant sleeper matchup, in my opinion. Is there anything you want to touch on here? Uh, not, not really. Okay. Seems pretty straightforward. All right, Weston got embarrassed again. Are you surprised by how many embarrassing performance Weston has put out this season? I mean, he's had some real stinker weeks. Uh, it's it's not that surprising. I think, like, Weston drafts very boomer busty um, players individually. Um, he manages his depth well, but, like, when you draft these boomer bust guys like you can have these like hit multiple floor games and they a lot of them have low floors and that's sort of i think what happened this week and then like when you sort of have that like 
he likes to go for like the B tier quarterback build, which is like fine, but those guys then have a 10 point floor. So when like all of your floors hit and they're low, it's like this is what happens, right? He can still beat anyone when the ceiling's hit, but and it, he's pretty deep, right? Like probably the deepest team in the league right now. Um, but it, it's not that surprising, I guess. It's a okay. long winded way of saying that. <laughs> One guy on his team that shit the bed was DJ Moore, and the Panthers have completely blown it up. They're in stunning free fall. Over the past few weeks, they've fired about every coach on the staff, including Matt Rule. They've traded Christian McCaffrey. They've traded Robbie Anderson. They're shopping DJ Moore. Like, what are your thoughts on the catastrophe that is the Carolina Panthers this year? <laughs> so, like... I saw that McCaffrey got traded and I saw that his backups were available and I literally was like well why do I want his backups like knowing that his backups were going to potentially be like getting a main part of a sh like a, their backfield it's just <laughs> if that makes sense like that's that's yeah. how I feel about the Panthers like totally. I, they were available I had an open roster spot and I just didn't pick them up yeah you're like they're so bad there's not even any value here <laughs> yeah it's, all it is is going to eat up a roster spot and like tempt me to start them and I just I never want it. like I just think there's no way they end up having any value other than like a desperation flex yeah. At that point, I'd rather just roll the dice with like a boomer bust wide receiver that's always out there, you know. I agree. And this is one of the most catastrophic and horrific midseason meltdowns we've ever seen from a team. This is not just a quarterback getting hurt and you start off one and five, or there is a significant injury and a couple close losses and you start out 0 and 4. This is a absolute meltdown on the level of Chernobyl that's going to set this team back for a half decade. And they're trading away any asset they can for chiclets. They didn't even get a single first round pick back from McCaffrey. That and was insane. Yeah, this is a top trading tier McCaffrey running back we're talking about. Trading McCaffrey if you're a Panthers about. fan is just like insane. Yeah, and it's like, like what do we like, get back well, for him? Two first? LOL. No, it, 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 it's wild. The, the 49ers fucking lease Carolina so bad. But like, what's more, what's more, what's more crazy to me was like, like if you're if you're Carolina, it's like, why why would you be giving them away? Like you're already bad. Like like it's not like you're getting bad. Just it's wild. It's just unfathomable to me why they would do that. <laughs> yeah, and for so little, it's one of those things where you're gonna give the face of your franchise away. And it's not only going to hurt the team on the field, but it's going to just tank fan interest. He's the only fucking reason that you would watch the Panthers, unless you're a hardcore Panther fan, and you're just going to dump that guy for nothing? You can't even get a single first rounder back? It's insane. The, the Matt Rule experiment failed in grotesque fashion. This is a seven-year contract we're talking about that the team gave up on after a mere four seasons. This is a fucking disaster. I, I, I know I've, I've talked about how much I hate the Texans front office, but like watching some of the Panthers shenanigans, they may like have beaten the Texans in my like rankings of incompetent front offices, honestly. I agree. And it's just very bizarre to me when you consider like Matt Rule's resume and it, he got so much media hype. And at the end of the day, you're looking around like, what has this guy done in the league? He won at Baylor when the Big 12 was at a point where it was so weak and so inept that the fucking conference was dissolving. You're, you know, it's like you're reigning over the dregs of a kingdom. And you're sitting there to yourself saying, well, uh, this is the guy we want. Seven years, completely unproven in the NFL. Seven year deal. And there wasn't a single moment during Matt Rule's tenure where you really got excited if you were a Panther fan or that you were watching the game and you're like, wow, those are some really creative plays and some creative sets. At least the Cliff Kingsbury era had a couple moments where you're like, oh, that was a cute play. Oh, okay, we can see what the coach is doing. The Matt Rule era, I think, is like right there with the, the Mike McCarthy era in terms of disappointment. 
The difference is McCarthy's in his contract year and he doesn't have three more years left that the team's going to have to eat. Just catastrophe in Carolina. Alrighty, so we can talk about mercifully Seagouch beating JP, dealing him his first loss after you narrowly lost to JP in the previous week. I noticed that both of your losses have been like within four points, so a little bit of bad luck there, but this is like exactly what I expect a to see. A couple outliers. A couple outliers, you know. And for JP, this is like a classic JP start where the top three players for him combine for like 60, and then the rest of his drippings do not much. And uh, the bye weeks are coming. I want to hear how you think JP is going to handle the bye weeks because well, he's made the bye weeks are positions. here. Yeah, they're here. <laughs> no, I mean, but like they're coming for weeks, you know. Yeah. I just meant like he's he literally is like doing like weird like potential colluding trades to like fix after dropping Tom Brady. Uh, it's just, like whatever. But yeah, he he's got Josh on a bye this week. That's what I meant by the bye weeks are here. Right. Um Yeah, I mean I'm 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 thinking he, he might rip off like two or three losses in a row here. Um, to be honest. I I just like sit here and I'm like, Taylor's been pretty underwhelming and like sort of injury prone. Um, you know, I don't know. Like I look at his team and it's just like in standard scoring, it's like his wide receivers are just nothing like some random scrub at tight end. Tight end really doesn't matter. LOL. But you know, it's just, I guess he's got Sanders, which I like gift wrapped to him, despite some people saying it was like an imbalanced trade. I'm pretty sure he won that trade. Um, yeah, I mean, I just I, his team isn't doesn't feel super deep, and he's gonna start having bye weeks. Uh, I think he loses this week for sure without like the Josh Allen monster mode. And right. even though Josh Allen has gone gone nutty every week like he's gonna have weeks where he's just gonna score 20 you know score one or two touchdowns 200 yards i just i, I don't think he's gonna go for 30 40 every week and i think he loses if he doesn't right yeah it's pretty um, much just one win condition is having josh allen solo carry him yeah change, changing the touchdown scoring roles from four to six has been like a huge boon <laughs> for for, for the Josh Allen build. <laughs> yeah, the Bills offense looks phenomenal, doesn't it? Yeah, they're nutty. Who Gotta you, be like Super Bowl favorites. Which offense do you think is more lethal? The Chiefs offense or the Bills offense? Oh, the Bills unquestionably. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, Ch the Chiefs are not that far behind, but it's just like... It feels like... It used to be an abundance of talent, and now it's more like the scheming, I think. Not that they don't have talent, but you know what I mean? It's just like they had an embarrassment of riches when they had Tyreek and like Kelsey, and uh, now it doesn't feel quite as much of an embarrassment with like one of those elite guys down. Uh, obviously, they're still great, but I just, when I watch the Bills, it's just like, like I mean, Diggs is great, Gabriel Davis is great, like... Knox is a threat like it just feels like they've got weapons everywhere and like it feels like the running threat that like Allen is is like just significantly higher than Mahomes and really adds a facet to that agreed to I that think, offense that the Chiefs don't have yeah I think it makes the Bills harder to game plan for Josh Allen's running ability and I think the Chiefs losing Tyreek makes them significantly easier to game plan for because he was so fast, you really had to play your safeties in a certain way that focused on Tyreek. And even though a lot of people were pretending like, oh, we have Juju, that's a replacement. Like the speed that Tyreek brought was so unique that it was just immensely difficult to deal with in terms of what, what's scheme. What's crazy to me about the Chiefs, um, and to be fair, I've only seen two of their games, uh, so maybe this is happening, but judging from some of the performances I'm suspecting it isn't to the right extent why aren't coaches just you man up you man up Kelsey jam him at the line and then just give help over the top like why aren't teams just like have someone other than Kelsey beat us agreed 
And I, I, maybe that's happening, but in the two games I saw, it didn't seem like it was happening. That's all I'm going to say. It's just well, surprising. Well, I agree, because it's like, w which Kansas City receiver do you expect to hard carry? Like, oh, Mercole Hardman's going to 1v... No, like, give me a break. And Kelsey has obviously been this incredible lethal touchdown monster who's great in fantasy. And the idea that you're not going to have a Juju Smith-Schuster who hasn't looked the same since AB left the Steelers. He sort of got exposed when a lot of people thought he would do well. And Mercole Hardman, who's never even been good from my perspective, like, I totally agree with you. Like, they should, w without the Tyreek deep threat, it should be much more easy to try to counter the Chiefs. But we can move on to the next matchup. That's a huge win for Christian. His first win, uh, Burrow and Mixon look good in a win against Nola. And, uh, wow, Pittman actually got him over 10, and Smith ruled in a touchdown versus the half yeah, of Yeah, I, I think you're way down on Pittman. Pitt, Pittman's talent is just the O-line's bad, so if, if they can't keep up Ryan upright, he's going to struggle. Okay. But I've, I've just heard you talk bad about Pittman a lot. I don't know. No, I, I, that, that's person. fine. I, I, like, I like the pushback. I like it when guys say, oh, you're too low on that guy. That's part of what the show's for. Yeah. Huge win for Gouch, and this is like a really big win within the context of our league because it prevents Christian from being 06 and basically being out of it, even though he's still like a super long shot. At least he has a win now and can maybe try to right the ship. But more importantly, JP takes his first loss, and his hard carry is on by this week, so it's a big week for JP this upcoming week. And then we have this little popcorn fart of a game where A.B. and Cam Joke played. And Cam Joke queefed out 65, and A.B. still lost to him. Kareem Hunt, 12 yards, LOL. Aaron Jones, less than 5 points. Uh, this is just a, a zoo of a performance. You try to start Geno to show everyone how smart you are. He queefs out a dozen. And Hopkins, a lot of people are saying, like, oh, now that Hopkins is back... The Cardinals are going to find their form. Like, what sort of impact does Hopkins coming back have on the Cardinals' offense from your perspective? Well, we already saw him. Uh, that was a Thursday game. Yeah, he looked pretty. He looked pretty impactful. He had a, uh, more he had impactful a, than I would thought. Yeah, he had 105 yards. But I mean, I'm not just talking about this last week. But you know, the Cards have looked fucking horrible. Like, do you think Hopkins is their savior, or is it going to be like more of the same, more like underwhelming performances? What was interesting is Marquise Brown is actually um, he got hurt that game, so it's funny. Like they had he was sort of the light guy, and now he's hurt. Um, he's going to be sidelined at least a month, and uh, so they like to me the reason why Hopkins was interesting was it's like oh well like teams can't hyper focus Brown like either Hopkins or Brown's going to be one on one and everyone like talks up this Rondell Moore guy and like they gave him one throw early in the game and were like oh like he's so good in space and it's like oh well he didn't do anything the other 55 minutes of the game I don't know it's just to me went like just nothing, nothing, not to me, nothing is really moving the needle. And like, I think they really needed that Hopkins Brown combo to both be healthy to really alleviate pressure from each other. Agreed. Skill from one to ten, what's Kyler Murray as a quarterback with five being average and ten being god tier? Like real life, probably like a six or seven. Okay. Fantasy, maybe a seven or an eight. Okay. Interesting. Uh, what do you think about AB's wretched performance here? This is a big deal. He, if he had won this, he would have been uh, within reasonable shouting distance of that first division spot. Now, like as it stands, he's a tepid 500. This is a stinker game. This should have been a fucking layup win for him. Yeah, well, he... Uh... I hear that like the discount double points like really really helps you win games. Um, you know, you get double the points, right? It's like a multiplier. But right. in this case, it probably cost him the game if you think about it. Right? Because uh, Seattle was so flaccid, you mean? 
Exactly. He was like double. He was basically like double betting on Seattle doing something with the Lockett and the Geno start. If he would have just like, like he only needed five points to win, basically, right? So if he just hedged his bets a little bit, which especially when you're evenly, if you're like a dog, I think the discount double points is sort of cute because it's like, well, I have to have like this. That this guy has to go crazy for me to win, and this guy will also go crazy because they're correlated, right? Yeah. But uh, if you, if you're pretty evenly matched, just like spread spread your buckets out and just win, <laughs> you know, like yeah. I mean, he has I think, one big droopy Seattle bucket with Pete Carroll's fucking yeah. visage on it. You're, you're you're just adding variance for no reason when like it. I don't know. I I just think it's silly. Uh, and I think a lot of people, even good people, like I know Jackson's a big fan of like discount double points, but I don't think he actually has ever thought about like what it means, uh, like when he does that. Okay. Now, AB takes a huge loss, and finally we have uh, Aaron putting up 73 and losing to Ryan, who put up 100. Zeke had 15, surprisingly, in a loss. But we can see, like, the, the Zeke Pollard double start, like, is pretty much never going to result in them combining for over 20. Still starting Herbert, who's not any good on a stinker team. And uh, Aaron still loses pretty badly. So, you want to just talk about what a disgrace Aaron's team is and how bad of a manager you think he is for a second? Um... I mean, he got unlucky with the Dobbins injury, so that that was that was unfortunate. Um, the Raiders were on by, so we really needed those points from Adams to sort of make up the difference. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think like this had anything to do with his management. Um, I think he reached for Camara a little bit in the draft because we knew, like, we knew that Taysom was going to be a factor in that offense. Oh, he's a big droopy factor. He's I, huge. I don't remember. I think he drafted Camara in the first, and I'm just like, if you're drafting Camara in the first, you're like, it's not going to be a timeshare at all with Taysom. Like, if that's the case, he is sort of a first. But I just think there were better options there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not too much here. Well, the he's still he's still three and three. And, well in contention yeah well the sick thing about Taysom is anytime the Saints get within the 10 yard line like not just the red zone but from like the 10 to the goal line the fucking playbook turns into like the Taysom special menu it's like how are we going to get the ball in the end zone well Taysom's going to touch it like whether he runs it in or throws it in like we've got to get Taysom out there so it's just such a cock block against Chimera yeah Okay, we can move on to the next week's matchups. We'll start out with me and Seagouch, as I'm just getting absolutely crushed by bye weeks. The following players for me are not an option because they're on bye. Diggs, Henderson, Singletary, Akers, and Hurts, and I also had to get a new kicker. So this is one of those weeks that is almost like a punt week for me. Very, very difficult. And do you think I have any chance here? It's gonna be it's gonna be a tough one. I'm gonna be honest. I mean, you always have a chance, but but Seagal just set up pretty pretty nicely, I think. Yeah. He's got some Cincinnati he, and Atlanta easy matchup. He's got some really 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 nice matchups. Swift could be coming back this week. He's out. Um, as far as I know, Swift's not gonna play. I mean. I think he could play. I think he's unlikely to play, but he could play. Um, he's at least questionable. He hasn't officially been declared out. Who knows what will happen tomorrow? But, uh, but yeah, I mean, the point is, like, he already looks like he can beat you, and then if he had Swift on top of that, I mean, he's uh, he's definitely definitely has to be favored, if nothing else. But yeah. I mean, anything can happen. I think one of my only win conditions is for Godwin to pop off for his terrible Carolina. And maybe for I mean, Danny Dimes to have a meltdown game against the Jags. I, I I actually think like I think your win condition is like a Kansas City shootout that like forces the Niners to like pass it a lot so they can't run it and 
play possession ball like usual. Yeah, Kyle Shanahan's goes through strata protecting a three-point lead from the first quarter. And they have like an implied like 30-point total. Or sorry, the the Chiefs have like an implied like uh, 28 point total and I guess the, the Niners have like 24 or something basically the point is like they're going to have to score three touchdowns they can't score two in a field goal and run the ball for 30 minutes Yep. so that's to me that's your if you win this game it's going to be because that game scored 60 and like you know four of the touchdowns were to the Niners and two of them went to AU Kittle or something like that How do you think that the Christian McCaffrey trade affects the value of the San Francisco receivers? I mean, it's not good. (laughs) It hurts him. Yeah. I will say what's interesting is the the Niners don't really throw the ball out of the backfield all that much, like, scheme-wise. Actually, I'm, like, double-checking it now because I haven't thought about this yet, but it seems like historically they're not, like, a big... Backfield, yeah. Like, they throw it a lot to the fullback, but the running backs, they almost, they threw zero times to the running backs last week. It's like, why do you... I guess they got them for, for table scraps, for chiclets, some might say. Um, yeah. And it's... Yeah, I'm looking at the week before. Yeah, again, two to full, the fullback. None to anyone else. But again, this is a team that's been utilizing Depot Samuels out of the backfield as well and throwing it to him out of the backfield. So it could just be a personnel thing, um, hypothetically, where they just haven't had running backs they trust to throw it to out of the backfield. Um, so if that's the case, it could be good. I, um, I have no idea, but it, yeah. I am a little confused why they would trade for him if they don't intend to throw it to him out of the backfield because that's like half of his value as a player. Well, I wonder if some of these plays that they've drawn up for Debo, these like running and like end around plays especially, if they're just going to like drop McCaffrey into those sets now to like get him the ball. I wonder if this is going to hurt Debo's value as far as... Oh, it's for sure going to hurt Debo's value. I think un- undoubtedly because he's... He's, there's no way, like, there's no way they're going to give as many looks from the backfield when you have McCaffrey. Like, it just yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, it, yeah, it's just a waste. It's a waste of talent to me. Like, to me, McCaffrey's the second most talented running back in the NFL. Uh, to who's, me, it goes. Who's like, number one? Barkley? Bark, Bar- Barkley, McCaffrey, then I guess Henry. Um, Is Zeke in the top 10 of that list? No, I'm definitely not. Okay, I'm glad we're on the same page with that. To, to me, like, and I know Henry lovers are going to be like, well, Henry's so good. Wash. He's not, he's not, no, he's good. He's not washed. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a receiving thing. He doesn't really get the looks out of the backfield that, like, you see Barkley. I mean, Barkley McCaffrey, these guys are getting it. I mean, this year, finally, Barkley's yeah. getting it, like, 20, 30 times a game. You know, combined out of the you know ten out of the backfield, twenty yep. on the ground, more dynamic. And, like, and McCaffrey's done that in, in history when the Panthers were better, and he's done a little bit this year. But I don't know that that's why I ranked them higher. It's very close though. Nice. All righty, I think we can move on. Seagulch definitely has the edge there, and in the same way that it's rough for JP to lose the Seagulch and then have to go on to play without Josh Allen. It's really nice for Seagouts to get that big W and then get to play against the skeleton crew. We'll move Definitely. on. We'll move on to Clap Four and Lily. And this is slated prediction wise to be a pretty close matchup. And uh, to me, Chicago's absolutely terrible, and I don't want any Chicago <laughs> assets on my team. Like excuse me, do you think that the Bears have one of, like, the most inept, pathetic offenses in the league? Like, where would you rank them? Like, bottom three? Because they're just horrible to watch. Yeah, they've got to be the worst, I would say, not bottom three. They got to be worse than the Panthers, I think. Yeah. The thing about the Panthers is, like, this has been, like, a, a total sewer disaster season that's blown up in their face completely and like I said earlier is going to set them back for like a half decade but that other team Chicago 
they everything went according to plan. Like Fields is still Fields. Like there's <laughs> they exactly what they sort of expected to happen is happening. It's not like the Panthers where everything went wrong and they're gonna have to tear it down. Like Chicago went into the season seriously saying like, oh yeah, Justin Fields, like he's our guy. Really glad we traded up for him. Really glad we got Big Dig Mitch before him. How a team could be so laughably off with their evaluation of quarterbacks and confidently trade up for them is just beyond me. And that's a team that is just unwatchable. Like there are some teams this season where when if they're if you're not watching Red Zone and they're on, like they're one of the two games that's on, or the Monday night, Thursday night game, just straight unwatchable. Like absolutely atrocious. But, no, definitely. But who do you think's gonna pick up this game? Um, yeah, it's tough. The, you mean like against Lily and, and yeah. Clap for, right? Yeah, Lily and Clap for, exactly. Oh, it's really, it, this is correctly forecasted close. I guess I'll, I'm pretty high on Jackson this week. Yeah. Um, he's in a good spot. And Stevenson has been like an actual absolute phenom getting three down work, which is really dominant I think I gotta edge him he just looks there's a couple more holes like this wood start is a little uh, suspect and starting McKinnon is like something yeah that's that's the word for it I also think CD Lamb and Dalton Schultz are going to get a lot of work this week Dak is back and they're playing the laughably weak porous Lions defense and whenever I think about the Dallas Cowboys coming off of their atrocious loss against the Eagles, with that coming back at home, it's like the softest landing imaginable. I think they're really going to be throwing it more than they have in previous weeks. And I love CD and Schultz this week, just in terms of like the impact they'll have on this matchup specifically. Also agree with your point about Jackson, and consequently Tucker will do well. Imagine the commish. All right, let's move on to Weston and Jax. Yeah, the I mean, the Cowboys have a 28-point team total. It's like one of the highest this week. Like, that's a pretty good spot. Nice. Jackson's rolling with Dak. Again, like Detroit, insanely bad. And the sort of team that can really have the opposing squad embarrass them late and run up leads. Like, not only is Detroit not very good, they can often get, like, non-competitive. That Seattle game was a fucking disgrace. Like, Dan, at, between that Seattle game and the New England game, I think, even though everyone loves Dan Campbell, I think he's sort of getting, like, gapped. Like, the other coaches are showing that they're not only more veteran than him and understand, like, the build orders and win conditions more, but I think he's, like, failing to get, like, the best effort out of his defense, like, what have been your thoughts on the Detroit Lions this year, Spence? Yeah, it's weird. I, I thought their defense would be better and the offense would be worse. Yeah, that's uh, a good way to put so, it. So I sort of got it backwards. But yeah, I mean, about what I expected, I guess, results-wise. Even if microchasm within the results, I was wrong, I guess. Over under four and a half wins for them this season. I think you asked me that before the season, and I said, I said five. So I guess I'll go over, but like, who cares? Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yep. All right. Looking at this matchup, though, between uh, Weston and Jackson, two teams that have middling records that could really use a win. Uh, Debo and. McCaffrey are facing off both of these guys have them on their team and if you draft the Debo a lot of times people did that around like the 12th or 13th pick and they did it expecting Debo to be this like dynamic guy who was getting the end of rounds and they were really trying to force him the ball and I think that with McCaffrey now on that offense suddenly you're not really as happy about having Debo on your team He's more of just a wide receiver one and less of like a, a carry of the offense. St. Brown coming back after injury, I'll think, I think he'll put up a dozen. I think Henry will probably have 15, and Brady's just going to torch Carolina. I really like this 
week for Weston, and I'm going to give him the edge. I think he'll score 102, and Jackson will score 90. Yeah, I uh, I think the difference maker for here is, like, the McCaffrey thing, and, like, even if McCaffrey is going to be good, like, he got traded Thursday. There's no way they're going to have him in more than a couple token sets. Like, this is, like, a flex guy this week, not RB2, I think. Interesting. Um, and interestingly, I think that, as we discussed before, there's some sort of, like, inverse correlation where, like, if McCaffrey's in, he's going to affect the, he's probably going to take some of the Debo sets. So that's sort of an interesting, like, mini micro battle between the two is how involved will McCaffrey be? Oh, I mean, hopefully for, I'm sure Jackson watches it because he seems to be pretty quick to news and stuff. But, like, I'm sure, like, at the 1030 injury report, there'll be, like, some announcement about, like, the snap count on McCaffrey. Um, yeah, and for that, they typically do, do. For that first week, I think that's sort of like hard to quantify and trust a lot of the times, you know. You know, not necessarily like that confident, like hearing that news. Like, you're gonna roll with them no matter what, because it's McCaffrey. But I agree. And the with four, you. and the Forty ers are like notoriously fickle with like, like some teams when they release a report, it's like, oh yeah, that's legit. Yeah. But like the Niners are one of those teams who, who are like, one of the least trustworthy especially with running backs when it comes to what they report. Agreed. That's another piece. What is interesting is like, this would take balls, but like, <laughs> I think starting Drake over McCaffrey, particularly if you get like the heebie-jeebies with the news right before Locke, that would be really interesting. Right, because Dobbins is hurt and now Drake is the main guy and they're playing a Cleveland team that looked inept last week. Yeah, so I mean that... That could be the difference maker, potentially. Um, it would take a lot of courage to do so. I don't know if I would pull the trigger, but that, that's sort of an interesting thing to at least bring up. So. All righty. Do you have a prediction for this one? it got to be Weston. I yep. just... Better better top to bottom, pretty much. And I think Henry's in an amazing spot. He's going to go nuts this week. Love that. All right, we can move on to JP versus Bing Bong. And as we touched on earlier, JP having to start Mac Jones coming off of an ankle injury. And, that's and, into, and, and into Chicago. Yeah. All right, what do you think about this matchup? To me, this is like a pretty like, oh, JP should just straight lose this one. Yeah, I mean. Cam, Cam already got already, 20 from his yeah. flex, LOL. And, like, he's got Barkley in a smash spot, Eckler in a smash spot, Herber in a smash spot. I mean, the Seattle game's the highest total of the whole week. Um, Pretty crazy. And he's got three guys from that game. <laughs> the only weak spot is, like, Terry McLaurin is sort of a joke. But, like, it won't matter. He'll just hit. He could beat him without with that spot empty, as far as I'm concerned. He also his defense is in a good spot too, with the Dolphins playing shitty Pittsburgh. So I mean, there's no way Cam loses this. Not even Cam yeah. could fuck this up. Not that he I would mean, even check his team Sunday morning. It it, w it would literally take two brutal like first play of the game injuries for him to lose this. Honestly, I could be wrong, but like that that that's how far ahead it feels like he is. Yep, I agree. This is a big, big week for JP to lose for my division. Five and two is a long way from seven and zero. Oh if you get my drift. What's crazy is if Cameron wins and I lose, <laughs> he's he's now uh, he's now going to be at the top of my division. Wow, that's more funny than it is worrying, and you know that. <laughs> uh, I'm worried, man. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't be. All right, let's move on. We got AB versus Ryan. Both of these teams desperately need a win. And Ryan already has 17 points because overrated New Orleans threw two pick sixes into the Cardinals' D. And the Cardinals hilariously put up 42 points. And Kyle... Oh. <laughs> In that game? Yeah. <laughs> it was Dal Dalton that threw the, the pick sixes. And it was funny because he would like be he would be all depressed and he would run to the sideline and, 
and like Jameis would be like, like putting his arm over. It's okay, his man. Like, let that fucker fly. He's like, next time you see those safeties coming over, let it fly. Fuck them. It, it, was, it was just there's so much irony in that shot. I just thought I had to bring it up. It was funny. Oh, I love it. Jameis is over there, like, don't worry about that one, brother. That's a, you know, that's just shit. Let that one roll right off the back, man. <laughs> no one can get over an interception like Jameis. Like he's. He's like a good closer, you know, fucking right into the memory hole. That bad throw goes. You gotta love that attitude, especially when you take the over with him, right? Oh, yeah. Here we see A.B. He's doubling down on Geno Smith and Lockett again. And if we look at his bench, well, he has Jerry Judy against the Jets. Like, I think I might start Judy over Lockett personally. Like, what do you think about A.B.'s team? this week against Ryan no you, you've got to roll with Lockett um, he hasn't been as good in standard PPR he's been exceptional um, that's the highest total game of the week yeah I mean I, I think you've got to favor Austin he's already locked in 20 all of his players look to be in good spots I'm not in love with the players themselves other than Kelsey, but that's yeah, what it is. No, I agree because even though I'm not super high on AB's team, especially as quarterback, if you look at Ryan's team, yeah, big deal. The defense did great. But I do think that like Pollard and Zeke are due for good weeks. This would be like the week you would want to start them, you know, against Jokic Detroit. Who knows how sharp Tua will be in his return. Gusecki hasn't really been worth a motherfuck, honestly. Like, he's had a couple good weeks, but he's he's one of those tight ends that is going to find the end zone and get you fucking nothing. I don't like Claypool at all. I'm going to have to edge AB here like 85 to 80. I don't think he's that favored, but yeah, he's definitely favored. Maybe like 60, 65. No, 85 to 80, the score, not 85% oh, to win. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Okay. You want to give a, a take? You think AB slight edge? Yeah. Okay. Pretty much it. Okay. We'll move on to the final matchup. You versus Ramp. A matchup projected to be a three-point game. And two guys have already locked with Kyler getting you 20. And Chimera getting Aaron 10. Like Pretty average production out of both those cats. Like, what are you looking at in this game? Like, what are your thoughts as, like, the manager really needing this win? Yeah, um, I've had Chubb. Uh, I lost last week because Chubb had an off week, basically. Uh, I know it's like crazy to expect him to have a touchdown every week. He sort of has. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I think uh, I need a decent game out of him. I think Chase is in the smash spot. Yep, soft Atlanta. Um, Williams is in a great spot because he's against he's against Dallas, but like Swift is out, and even with Swift, I think he has standalone value. Carolina against the Bucks, great spot. Carlson against Houston, great spot. I mean, other than the Ceh, my whole roster is in pretty good spots. I would say. Um, I think Dylan's sort of a joke, like probably blow in flex. He is a joke. I don't know, I just... The only thing that has me worried is, like, I think Adams could just go nuts. Um, it's very possible, and I could win, but I think I have to fa favor myself here. Um, maybe 60% favored. Yeah, I'd give 75% to you. I think Dylan's going to go soft. I think Lazard is going to go soft. I mean, I know they're playing Washington, but... Both of those guys are hella overrated and sort of get like way too much credit because they play with Aaron Rodgers and there's this sort of meme of like, well, the Packers, they're going to be great. Like someone's going to get the touchdowns. Like the Packers are another NFC team this year that's been disappointing. It's part of why I like the NFC isn't all that good and I am as high on Philly as I am because the Rams, Cardinals, and Packers who... A lot of people thought we're going to be elite or very good or at least have fucking great offenses. Has not have not really been all that great this season. So 
I really like your team here. I, I agree with what you said. Like, what are your thoughts on Kyle Pitts this year? You've had him. He's ranked 22nd. He's got one touchdown. Like, has he been bottled up? Is Mariota not any good? Like, what have been your impressions of this guy? Because he was very hyped coming out of college. I mean, obviously, from where I drafted him, I've been a little little bumped out. But Mariota has has not really targeted him very much. He's been favoring the London guy a bit more. But I think, like, I also think he's played some, like, difficult defenses as well. Um, and he's been hurt one week, so. I mean, there's a reason why I'm rostering three tight ends, LOL. I love how... <laughs> I love how you have Taysom too. Like that's one of them. Tight end, like parentheses, Taysom Hill. Yeah, I'm. I, I thought about dropping him, but I just like it's too. It's too good. Like he gets too many red zone looks. Well, no. Like I probably shouldn't even say this on the on the thing, just in case. Hey, if they've cares. made it, to, if they've made it to this point in the video, shit, let true. it fly. True, true. You're like, so I'm gay. The- I'm coming out live on Twitch. Go ahead. So, so, like, I have this theory that uh, Dalton and Jameis are both so inept that they're going to just turn to Taysom quarterback in a bit. And, like, if you can start him at tight end and he's, like, getting quarterback production, it's just, like, it's like a cheat code. Yeah. Hopefully you'll so, start him the week when they make that decision because the NFL will probably come in and nerf it down if, they, if that yeah. does happen. Potentially, and then like the joke who's been the sixth best tight end, but like I can't give up on Pitts. It's like <laughs> if Pitts has a couple more bad weeks, I might literally just drop him because there's no reason for me to like keep him when the joke is performing so well. Yeah, it's just silly, but it's also ridiculous because then I'm starting. I would be starting a Joku, but I also don't want to have three Browns in my lineup. Yeah, two is pushing it. So. <laughs> Alrighty. But, so you want to give the a issue is I said the issue is they're all they're all all the Browns are so good. I think I was right about the Browns when we were talking preseason. I was high on the Browns and you were questioning it. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, uh, I, I I like I said I think I'm gonna. Yeah, I give it to you too, and I think the Browns have been better than I thought. What they look like last week is sort of how I imagine them looking every week, but no, they've been pretty damn good. I think the Steelers being so horrible and the Bengals being so disappointing is a big deal for them. Like, this is a team that, I mean, they could potentially challenge for a a playoff spot. I don't think Baltimore is that good. I think they've been figured out to some extent, so... Is there anything that you want to close out with here for this episode? Maybe a bit of banter or a boldy prediction? I mean, I feel like I would just be being a dead horse if I bantered at this point. But, uh... Too good and too cool for banter. No, I mean, you you can't, like, when someone's, you you know, he's dead already, you know, so... I'll just, no, uh, just call Aaron easy and be done with it. <laughs> no, Aaron, you're uh, easy, son. I think what's the the most interesting story to me is like we sort of all know like Cameron is gonna fade when the bye weeks come. Uh, Lily, even though she has a great record, I just heard I look at her team and I'm like, how how is her team that good? You know what I mean? Is it like? She feels like it has a ton of holes. Um, I think Weston ends up winning that division, but then if I think if I think the Watsons fall, which I th- I do think will happen when the bye weeks start hitting, then the wild card is wide open, right? Because that means all the teams that are three and three and two and four are well in the race, right? So to yeah. me, that's the interesting story, like. I mean, anything can happen. I can have an injury. Cameron can maintain whatever, but I think my division is pretty, pretty well set. Like with how strong my team looks and what we know about Cameron at bye weeks, and 
Ryan's two games back, really three games back because of the, the tie-breaking implications. And then, you know, Christian's four. I think JP is like... I, I think he could lose the division, surprisingly. Oh, like, I agree. Like, Especially I gonna, with his management skills. Like, if he loses this week and, like, you or Austin win, win like, y'all are a game back. And, like... The tiebreakers are in play. Like he's not up, run up so many points that like oh, I can't beat him on the tiebreaker. And there's also the head-to-head -head stuff. I don't know. I just your division is open. I think Weston just he's so deep. Jackson's doing his best, but I just I just think he had a he had a tough year where he just missed on a lot of his pocket picks. I guess. I just, I, I mean, his, his point, look at his point score. He's at 460. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's like, he's a great owner and like, I'm glad he's fighting it out, but I think <laughs> I'd be lying if I thought, said I thought he was like live to win that division. He's live for maybe a wild card, but I don't know. I just think there's so many teams and so many, so much right. I just, my, I mean, it's never over till it's over and he's going to manage his way until the end, but it's going to be an uphill battle, I think. So. All right, that was Twiff. Spencer, you did a great job. Audience, sub and like the video and stay easy.